Money is something that you don't see because in fact it's the air between us. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's the medium. The medium. Right, in right. which we can market. Money is always very philosophical. Time is money. And is money uh, also time? Yes. Money shouldn't really be a noun, it should be an adjective, <laughs> if even that. The notion that money is in a way potentiality. I remember I started thinking about this problem as money being the world's first social protocol through which we are invisibly leaving clues for each other about what things are worth. And those clues are picked up by others. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. We, we did a little bit of outlining of our conversation uh, before starting here. And one of the broadest areas to start with and an area that has really become the central theme of this show is, I guess, what you could call the philosophy of money. Uh, and the point you made earlier, that philosophy really is sort of the broadest context um, of uh, broadest context of, of knowledge, I guess you might say, when we're talking about things. Mm. But for some reason, which is a, a question I'd like to ask you, as you said, when you start asking the question, what is money, you very quickly end up talking about philosophy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, why is that? that What's going on? Well, why is that question you know, probably interesting? Well, it is interesting the era that we are living in. In one way, we are we're fortunate with uh, Bitcoin and crypto. We're in an era of uh, a reinvention of money, at least a strong attempt at reinventing money, and that is uh, pushing us into rethinking at a very fundamental level what money is, what its value is, and that does take us into philosophical territory. And then all of the controversies about the nature of money and the value of money, we are we are engaged in it. So. In addition to very narrow technical and engineering questions about money, we are debating the politics, the value, even the epistemology and the ontology of money, that is to say, very philosophically. Now, uh, one way of illustrating the, the significance of our historical era, just as you know, the last generation or so, though, is to put it in even broader historical context, that uh, money as a widespread phenomenon is relatively new in, in human history. It's really only uh, less than uh, 3,000 years of human history. 
Uh, uh, so if you go back, for example, to the Greeks, who were among the very first to introduce coinage that was then used in a widespread fashion for commercial and other purposes. Uh, but uh, you know, as, as, as wise as the Greeks were, uh, they hit upon this form of money and, and decided to use it for social purposes less than 3,000 years ago. But to put that in context, human beings, the anthropologists will tell us, have been around for maybe 300,000 years. So, you know, I'm just sort of making that number up because I'm not a professional anthropologist, but Homo sapiens sapiens, us with the big brain, maybe 300,000 years. That's to say, if we hit upon the use of money less than 3,000 years ago, that's to say that money came into existence less than 1% of human history. Right. And uh, uh, so that was a revolution, and it occurred you know, in, a, in a few places in, uh, in the world at a particular time. And why that happened, where it happened, and when it happened is, uh, is, is fascinating. So part of the, the point then is uh, that as we go back to the Greeks for many things, the origins of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, philosophy, for example, you know, how, uh, the way we do much of our theater in the modern world, science and mathematics, uh, there was something special about Greek culture that enabled it to achieve on a high level in many areas. But then money in particular, if you think about money, it's, a, it's an abstract representation of wealth, and all of that, of course, needs unpacking. But it is a, it's a cognitive achievement, and somehow it took 99% of human history <laughs> to get us to the point where we're able to operate at that level of abstraction to conceive of something like money. And then also that society had evolved to the point where it could support an institution like money that it was big enough, that it was committed to peaceful trade enough. And of course, that's what money is primarily about. It's in a social context. We're going to trade with each other and use this abstract medium of exchange. We're going to trust each other across long distances and across time, even though we don't particularly know each other. It can only happen that money uh, becomes a phenomenon when certain social and cultural achievements have been reached as well. So uh, just just to, uh, at the beginning, point out that money rests on certain cognitive achievements. It rests on certain cultural and social achievements. Uh, and understanding those, in part, can illuminate where we are now, that we are precisely trying to reconceptualize money uh, in this uh, the Bitcoin era, if I can use that shorthand tag, and then also try and effect to create a, a, a new social institution uh, with certain presuppositions about trust across distance, across anonymity, and so on. So uh, I guess my shorthand tag would be that you know, money is always very philosophical. The trust factor of money, I would argue, it actually coalesces to those properties. So the, the, the very nature of value itself is value is the relevance of a thing to our goals, right? Whatever yeah. closes the gap between my wishes and their fulfillment is valuable to me. Anything that blocks that process is destructive to value. Anything that is irrelevant is just valueless. Yeah. Right? So value is this inherently subjective quality of existence, quality of being. Um, and, and, you know, we, we look at the world through a lens of value. Things to us are either obstacles or tools getting us on our way or blocking us along that path. So historically, gold was the tool that best satisfied those properties of money. And that's why over a, an entire history of entrepreneurial experimentation, the free market selected gold as money. It was the most divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, and scarce thing in the world. So we could say gold earned the trust of market participants without any authority being involved whatsoever. I mean, you could say the authority of God, perhaps, right? Gold was governed by the laws of chemistry and nature such that its supply could not be artificially increased. Um, it's essentially indestructible. So it had a very high stock to flow ratio, which is another way of saying it did not inflate quickly. Its supply increased about 2% year over year. So if you parked your wealth in gold, you knew 
you could trust, you had a lot of confidence that your wealth would only be inflated about 2% every year, no matter what anyone tried to do, mm -hmm. right? No matter what law government passed or anything that happened in the sphere of politics and human affairs, nothing could change that. So it was a, a trusted base layer. Um, so I don't think authority, and that, that would be my point there with gold, is that you don't need authority to establish trust. What you need is time and experimentation, mm -hmm. right? What, what, what tool solves uh, the aim for people? And the aim with money is to move your economic value or wealth across space and time. So what holds its value across time? That's what's first and foremost. And then secondly, what can be used to transact that value across space with other market actors? Mm -hmm. um, and that One of the things gold has that Bitcoin doesn't have is that you can use gold to make a crown. Right. You can use right. gold to make you can use gold to make an altar or you can use gold to make a throne, which actually use... marginalizes its monetary use case, I would say, well, and because, I, it becomes dedicated to something higher. That's one of the reasons why I'm saying that it that's how it gets its authority, because it's shiny and it and it gets dedicated up. Right, it gets offered to God, you could say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is correct. This is how gold so another way to understand money, and by the way, this is why the show is called The What Is Money Show, mm. because this question has a million answers. Um, money, another definition of money is that it is the most exchangeable or tradable or liquid asset in a trade network. So if you go into a prison today, very often they use cigarettes as currency, mm -hmm. right? That's just the most tradable asset that they have access to, and it best satisfies those properties. Mm. So it, it is it is money in that trade yeah. network by definition. Um, so gold emerges as the most tradable thing because it satisfies those properties, but it was only ever traded in the first place because it had industrial use, making a crown, building an altar, build what, jewelry, dental, electronics, whatever this is. And still today, gold has a market cap of like $10 trillion about 10 to 20% of that is its industrial use. So it's its use as non-money. Anything gold can do that's non-monetary, there's a demand for that. So we could say the entire configuration of demand for gold is part industrial or utility use and part monetary use. And in, in that lens- it has, a, it has a story, it has a story use, like a mythological reality. Yes, yes. Like it's the head of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's the- you know, it's the, the first age is the golden age. It's the, yes. it, has a, it has a memory, like in terms of, of humanity that we can't get rid of. Like people think, like I've heard people say things like, if we all agree that gold wouldn't be worth anything, then it would, then it would stop. That's not how it works, That's right? Because that memory is deeply yeah. ingrained in, in all of our stories from all the fairy tales, all our myths, all their stories have, let's say something like gold, silver, and the other precious metals as part of the, of a, of, a, of a collective memory, you could say. Yes, absolutely. They, they have been proven over time to serve this purpose. Mm. But with that process, you have a, a bivalent money, a money that's part used in industry and part used as money. And through that same lens, this is another reason why Bitcoin is radically new. And I liked, you, you talked about, the virgin archetype in one of your podcasts recently, where the virgin is something that is purely dedicated to one purpose, right? It's untainted by any other purpose. It has one sole focus, essentially. Bitcoin is the first virgin money. It's the only money that is all of its market capitalization is for its monetary use case. You cannot make a crown out of Bitcoin. You cannot make a throne or put it in your teeth or whatever. Yeah, it's close to pure potential, you could say, as close as possible. It's the most purified monetary technology that has ever existed. It's perfected all the properties of money and it has no alternative use case whatsoever. Um, and in, in terms of, to get back to your point on coinage, coinage actually emerged initially as a private business function. So when people would trade with gold, you needed to weigh the gold. You needed to assay it. You needed to make sure it was authentic. That yeah, it trust. Yeah, trust, trust right? that it was real, the real thing. Exactly. You needed to make sure it wasn't lead, coated in gold, et cetera. Yeah. So 
every time you exchanged gold, you had to go through this time intensive process that increased transaction costs and was a friction to free trade, basically. Yeah. In comes the, the coinage function where a private certifier would instead stamp these Bandit. gold coins saying, you can trust this stamp. You know, you trust me. A. You trust yeah. me so you can trust this stamp. That's right. You're replacing the reputation of the coinage issuer with the need to assay the gold. And if, that, if it's ever incorrect, then you go after the coinage issuer. Yeah. Well, that issuer became more and more centralized and controlled by the state over time in almost every society around the world. And that's why we always end up with these smug emperor or dead president faces on all of our money. Hmm. Um, they're, they're trying to actually insert belief or uh, trust in the state, right? As being the, the bearer of that commonwealth. Um, but what they've actually done is just commandeer a free market function. And Again, to look at Bitcoin through that lens, if you you run your own node, that's why you run your own node in Bitcoin, which means you're running your own independent history of Bitcoin with every transaction. So you don't need to trust anyone. You are your own central bank, if you will, or your own coinage issuer. You can verify with 100% certainty and 0% trust that the Bitcoin you are receiving is in fact authentic Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, and that's a game changer as well. Yeah. And I think it's like, I, I get it. I, I understand like the image you use of the idea of the virgin uh, and also the, the notion that money is in a way potentiality, right? It's the, mm. the, this, the dissolution of your goals or, you know, it's like, it's the dissolution of your goals, whether it's buying something, objects or services or whatever, you know, into a potentiality that you can then redirect towards different yes. things. Like that's what money seems to be at least especially in the modern world um and so this is to me like this is this is the key that i was trying to get to before and you probably won't agree with me but it seems like the fact that that's what it is means that it's either everything or nothing that it's either that it's either it will have it will like you said it'll reach massive amounts of value or it will me mean that be worth nothing because it doesn't participate doesn't have a kind of gritty hierarchy in it which is the gold like the, the, like like you said the the gold is not pure value in the sense of pure potential it it also can be used to make things mm -hmm. and so because of that it's like worse comes to worst Right, worst comes to worst. If I have a an iron bar, it has a value, but I can also use it to make a sword. Right, mm -hmm. I can use it to make something. And uh, you yeah. know, if I have a stack of wood, it's maybe will never be worth as much as Bitcoin, but I can use it to make a cabin. Whereas if Bitcoin, because it's just pure value, that seems to me at least to account for its like huge uh, up and down. It's. Uh... Another thing uh, is that free speech only makes sense if if property rights have already been violated, right? Uh, uh, be, be, because if if we have absolute property rights, then you get to say what whoever gets to say what on your property. You set yeah. the rules, right? Uh, which is because there's no such thing as free speech. Like, right? <laughs> it it comes at a cost always, so it's an illusion. And the same goes for like the word money. When we were in like talking about semantics and all this, like money shouldn't really be a noun; it should be an adjective, <laughs> if mm -hmm. even that, because every good and every service, uh, every thing has a moneyness to it yeah. and can be used as a medium right. of exchange. Yeah. So it's a quality, not a phenomenon per se. Exactly. So I would say that our speech now, your voice and my voice, are acting as money. They have a certain moneyness yeah. to them since we're exchanging value with one another mm -hmm. by just talking. And and like, so so I think a lot of that illusion that money is a physical thing, that it's a noun, mm -hmm. has caused so much damage to the human race. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we think it's this fixed thing yeah. and therefore some entity can capture it yes. and, and start Zero printing more. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, I've been doing the Atlas Shrugged audiobook. First uh -huh. time I've gotten through it, I'm about 
probably 80% of the way through the book. <laughs> I know the, it's, it's long and it's, it's tedious. 64 <laughs> hours, but it's yeah. so good. Like, it is. Her writing is unbelievable. The voice acting is extremely good. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. But one of the points she makes in that book is that America was the first nation to make making money like a thing, like a phrase. Yeah. Whereas we, we almost enculturated this idea of the positive sum game of, of money and wealth. Whereas in the past, it had always been about like what you, like you just described, you needed to go take someone's yeah money to, to have more of it. But we can actually increase the purchasing power of money through work and trade and collaboration. Yeah, I, I think even that phrase, though, has a negative connotation now. Because now there's so many companies and institutions that make money right. by fooling people. And right. not by doing anything productive at right. all, but, but exchanging papers That's with right. one another and and just so they're not really making money they're taking money right yeah they're, they're making money by taking money yes or like because you have to remember like every time you use a fiat currency you're stealing from your children mm-hmm. so so like if you're if you're even hold a fiat currency even hold fiat yeah. currency I mean, yeah spend it, just have no that's account. another yeah. use case saving it yeah uh because saving is a delivery to you with yes. action so like uh so it's all if you want to live by don't steal, uh, that's extremely difficult to do mm-hmm. because almost everyone needs to use fiat currency every now and then. Mm-hmm. So you can't, like, don't steal is impossible to live by in this world. Maybe it'll be possible in a hyper Bitcoinized world, but yeah. like the vectors are pointing in the right direction. But still, it's a very hard thing to live by if you think about what stealing actually means. Yeah, it's not a fun thought actually because, you know, I have accounts. Depressing. Well, I have accounts with dollars in them. And then, you know, a lot of the work we talk about how all of the evils that are made possible through the dollar based world order. And it's like, well, if I'm saving in dollars, then I'm actually contributing to the reservation demand for that instrument. Yes. Which means I'm increasing the purchasing power of the dollar, which means I'm funding everything that the Federal Reserve funded US government is doing. You're playing their game. Yeah. And you're able to leverage their game because you're on that side of what's the saying when you're if a flock of people are uh, if there's a grizzly bear bear uh, chasing down people mm-hmm. you don't have to be faster than the bear you mm-hmm. just have to be faster than the the, the slowest Slow. person yeah uh, theory and, and that's what the Fed is like yeah. someone always has to pay and it's always the the poorest that yeah. pay and right. and it's very it's a brutal game to play. Yes. Uh, so, so, but with with Bitcoin, that's that's simply not the case. That that you you can't have the zero sum game if in a hyper Bitcoinized world, it doesn't work. The only way for someone who owns a lot of Bitcoin to to uh, uh, extract value from his stack is to spend the Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thereby giving them to someone else. Fascinating. It, so. I don't know. It seems to me like we get in these deep rabbit hole conversations and money ends up being almost like a structural metaphor for the way reality works. Yeah. You know, like it touches all these different domains of human existence and it's, there's not real like fixed, discrete phenomenon in nature. It's this continuum. Yeah. Uh, You know, things are interconnected through change and exchange. As you were saying earlier with language, like there's a moneyness to our language yeah, yeah. as we're using it as a medium of exchange of human conception. Yeah. Money more properly understood is like a medium of exchange of human action, perhaps. But everything in reality seems to be exchanging with other things in reality. And there's so there's yeah. a moneyness to, to the nature of reality. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as I said, like when we view money as a physical thing. It's it, we're we're depriving ourselves of that insight. Like mm-hmm. we're we we miss a lot of opportunity because we don't see other stuff as money. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so I think we interact differently be under fiat paradigm because we we think that this is the only way we can trade, which is absolutely not. Like yeah. all you need is a bit of imagination. You can trade in all sorts of different ways and some love. Yeah, and some love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're tied together. Yeah. <laughs> So this is great. All right. My takeaways from this conversation is money is an adjective, not a noun. Yeah. We are the games we play effectively. 
Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't say you are your dollars, but I would say you are your bitcoins, because as a very the, the well, I'm saying if you operate as a a market actor in a fiat paradigm, like you respond to those incentives and your behavior and actions yeah. are less collaborative, more destructive. Yeah, exactly. And you uh, you fuel the fire of that game. Right. Like you're you're choosing to participate in some in an immoral scheme. We inherit the attributes of the money we use then. Yeah. If yeah, it's like yeah. deceptive, destructive. That's a whatever. good way of putting yeah. it. So so like the, that's the ethos of Bitcoin is something that's talked about a lot in this space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what that is. Like we we become more ethical because we use a system that doesn't allow for unethical behavior in the same way as really? that the current system does. Yeah. Wow. If only more people understood that. Yeah. So for me, how I see what happened is that in in a situation of 100, 150 years, different little by little uh, political decisions made people to forget what money was. It was 5,000 years of trying to find the best money and trying to evolve it, making it paper money uh, in the private banks, not in central banks, and more or less working. And then little by little, making that knowledge uh, disappear. A few generations after, people didn't, well, some people discussed, of course, but common people didn't discuss, accepted dollar, accepted paper as good money. And this is where we are. We're in a moment that they don't have anything forcing uh, to to have a, a good uh, monetary policy. They just can do whatever they feel is better. Right. So this is the situation we are now. They can do whatever they want. They have different mechanisms of uh, increasing the monetary base and that affecting the monetary offer. So at the end, when you see the graphs, there is this website, you know, this famous website of what the, what the F uh, happened in 1971. When you see the graph, that, that has to mean something. Why do we use uh, flats and houses for, as a store of value? Why? Because uh, people have uh, big problems in using other means of uh, storing value. And then they store value in the things they know. That's why it's nearly impossible for somebody who starts to work and works for five years to buy a flat uh, without a, a mortgage. And this is a situation where why people is uh, speculating with uh, homes. Well, maybe just first of all uh, start asking, uh, what's the problem with money? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. It's as if the the disciplinary pressure that gold provided for government, mm -hmm. like keeping governments honest, keeping government growth limited, um, that was the the yoke that was thrown off in 1971, right? Just like, no more of this. Um, giving governments this capacity to print currency ad infinitum and therefore mm -hmm. grow without limits. Uh, and individuals have no check on that, right? Like typically, if a government was being irresponsible with their monetary policy and overproducing currency, savers could move wealth into gold and leave the country. And that would, that would apply a disciplinary force on that country to be more responsible uh, with our monetary policy and accountable to the preferences of those citizens. But once you remove that option, it's like, that's why government has run amok. Um, mm -hmm. at least, at least it's one of the primary reasons. Like I, I don't see the possibility of the centralized nation state swelling to the size it's become today without this move to a fiat currency standard. Why this, uh, civilization that we're using shells as money, mm -hmm. stop using money. Because uh, Europeans came and they brought uh, a lot of shells. Counterfeit little. Yeah. And they didn't realize that that was not good money. Yeah. And that's how in 5,000 years history, we realized that gold is, uh, was yes. the best money. Yeah. Because so, we can't counterfeit it. Exactly. Yeah. And now, uh, this is uh, my lesson. No, like they made bit by bit because 1971 is the famous year, but I think it was way more important than 1933. Mm. It was the moment that they forbid gold. Right. And, and when the moment that you start forgetting what is money? Mm -hmm. After a few generations, it's very easy to just like, oh, remember that thing of gold? No, it's mm -hmm. not anymore here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just what you are used to. It's just paper. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's, it's, it's just, just shells. It's just... Huh. It's once we... It's something about that mistaking. You start to mistake 
Because the dollar was just a representation for gold originally, right? It's like a paper warehouse receipt you take to the warehouse to get gold. Mm. But over time, if people get accustomed enough to transacting in just that paper, then they f- they forget what money is, as you're saying, right? They forget that it it's supposed to be a representation for gold. And then you can get people to just have confidence in the paper itself. And then you're in, you're engaged in a confidence game. Like the, the dollar will work to the extent that people will continue thinking and acting as if it works. All the while, you know, the central bank is uh, in- expanding the supply of that currency, debasing its purchasing power. And so you're trying to, you, you end up getting in this situation where the central bank and the nation state, it needs to lie to the people, right? To convince them. Uh, or in God we trust, right, is on the dollar. You know, all of these these mythological symbols and sayings to try and impart integrity to the dollar when in fact the integrity is being violated all the time mm-hmm. through, through currency counterfeiting. Um, it's, it's like a long-range or long-term psychological operation, yeah. getting people gradually to forget what money is such that you can steal from them systematically. Yeah. Um, okay, we're we're dancing around my favorite question here. So I have to ask you, um, we've talked about people forgetting what money is perhaps even by design. Mm. Um, what is money? Uh, when someone asks you this question, there's after three years of doing this, I have more questions than answers. Actually, Yeah. What approach do you take in explaining the nature of money? Uh, if I have the time and it's a friend, what I try to, to make him think is that to go back in history, Mm-hmm. And to explain the the problem of the the barter economy, no, I don't even know if barter was a really like a thing for long. Uh, I think that we were using debt uh, in small circles, and and then we started using money. Um, but uh, yeah, when you are in that economy, it's, it's very difficult that uh, we can have the same needs at the same moment mm-hmm. with uh, what you produce and I produce. So you need the uh, you will exchange things to another good, to another commodity that you know that uh, somebody else will accept. So to make the trade, you start accepting something that you don't really want, but that you know that will be accepted. And then this is the how money is born. It's just a commodity that you are just getting. And maybe at some point it was different commodities that you were accepting, like, okay, do you have salt? No, I don't have salt, okay. Do you have shells? Yeah, I have shells. Okay, give me shells. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that you can be accepting different things that you know that will allow you to eat tomorrow, for mm-hmm. example. Uh, and that, there is an evolution. Like uh, the this commodity, uh, there is one commodity that gets commonly accepted, generally accepted. Mm-hmm. And this is how we find money. And I would say that money is this thing that is generally accepted and that generates less friction in between people that will provide you the things that you need. Mm. So this is how born, money was born and this is how I see it's just a medium mm. to exchange, a medium that you want to hold mm. for a while, not to for consumption, mm. but for you to be able to get other things in the future. Mm. A way of storing um, wealth mm. for the future. It's funny when you when you articulate that description, it it sounds a lot like language too, right? Where mm. there's a means of uh, reducing friction in human interaction, right? Versus you and I sitting here trying to fight over a sandwich or something, right? We could actually talk through. Oh well, maybe we could cut it in half. You know, we can negotiate. So it's a, it's a a means for reducing friction between humans, such that humans can cooperate at scale. It sounds very much like a language. But what what would be language for you in in this example? Well, something like English, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, compared to to this uh, money analogy, you, yeah. I'm asking this because I I think that language would be the market, mm. and the money is something very that you don't see because, in fact, it's the air between us. Oh uh, yeah, the air. it's the medium. The medium, right, in right. which we can market. Right. Uh, we market. So we language mm-hmm. through this medium and money is just this medium. Mm. So people just was trying to find the best air yes. in which they could communicate uh, market. They could, could make, create market. Yes. So, um, and yeah, that's, that's my way. It's a medium, a medium of exchange. Right. It's the air. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the substance between us. 
through which what we're propagating left? messages. Yeah. If we would be in space, yeah. no air, right. no communication through voice. Right, 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 right. That makes no money. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it that way. You're, you know, water to a fish, right? It's kind of like their medium of exchange, yeah. something like that. Um, and it makes it hard to conceive of it and talk about it because it's hidden in plain sight. I like there was a long time that we didn't understand that air was even a substance yeah. because it's not visible. Um, and that's what politicians use because yeah. it's hidden in yes. plain sight. Yes. People don't think about it. They just use money. Yeah. And money was dollars. Yeah. Uh, so dollars, the same dollars before 1971 are as good as dollars now. They are right. dollars. So because this is our air. Mm. Yeah. And then you can just change the definition of a dollar and perpetrate the biggest crime in human history basically the biggest default yeah yeah that's right if you are a business owner or manager you should know these three numbers 36,000 25 and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system which allows you to streamline accounting financial management human resources and more NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. I have to ask you a question. You can ask me three. And, and it is the most important question on this show. <laughs> John, what is money? I'm part of the George Gilder fan club, I guess. Okay. I think, I think, uh, and he writes persuasively, especially in his last book, uh, Life After Capitalism, time is money. And is uh, money also time? Yes, the way it works out. I mean, yeah. we think of money as our gold or our dollars or our credit cards or whatever, but the reality is time reflects the value of money. Time reflects the value of service. Mm -hmm. uh, you work you build up this thing we call money because it, you spent time making that money. Yes. Whether it's hourly wages or profits from your business or profits from your investment, you, that's it represents a certain time value. Yes. And that time translates into your ability to buy stuff, to save stuff. Um, but but it's, it's the best explanation of it is to go to Gilder's books uh, if he wrote a very famous book in 82 called Wealth and Poverty, Reagan's most quoted book. Then he wrote uh, Knowledge and Power here about five, six years ago. Very, very important, but he summarized it. I, I always said he, he put too much stuff in, in uh, uh, Knowledge and Power, and he agrees. I, we had dinner last night. Uh, someday I want to be 83 years old and as in shape as he is. Uh -huh. he, and his, he and his wife were still out on the dance floor, B.B. King's. Wow. Uh, you know, when we left, the, uh, uh, us, young, amazing. us young guys just couldn't, 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 couldn't. He's in his 80s. Uh, he, oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, he, and he just won a world um, uh, uh, half marathon championship for his class. It, wow. So, I mean, he's, that's what I want to be in shape. <laughs> I want to be in his shape now, let alone when I'm 83. Yeah. Uh, so may I ask you go ahead a question if so and I I actually believe that as well like I've described money as time time is money uh, in a lot of my writing mm -hmm. now if we're using that description of money doesn't that mean that a central bank that can produce new units of currency ad infinitum out of thin air and they can externalize the costs of that product, or they're diluting the savings of savers right right Aren't they effectively stealing time from savers if they're stealing purchasing power by expanding the currency supply? Roughly, you're correct. Now, the reality is they could grow the money supply at nominal GDP. Okay. Right. Okay. Three, four, five percent, whatever. You'd still be stealing that growth. No, right? because because the, the, the country itself, the GDP itself is growing and you actually 
you actually have to have some lubricant and you got to have some oil mm -hmm. money money is right it serves that lubricant function um if you if you had a flat static supply that would mean um uh I mean, the purchasing power of savers is going up. Oh, the purchasing power of savers absolutely would go under up, up under that. But a gold standard is almost by definition deflationary. Mm -hmm. um, now, it would be nice. We'll never see one. Um, and, and you were talking about, you know, central banks always do. You've got, you can have low inflation and a central bank actually, you know, modestly printing money like Switzerland. Yeah, uh, Sweden's figured out, Norway's figured out to how to control their inflation with much smaller economies than, than the U.S. does. So in our particular case, we've got 12 people sitting around a table trying to decide the price of the most important thing in the world, exactly. which is the interest rates on the right, dollar. Right, of course. And rather than just saying, what is the market going to do? I don't think, there are not a lot of people that believe that the market would be pushing rates up to five and a half percent, soon to be six percent by the end of the year. Sure. Um, in and of itself. It's a consequence of central planning and the money. Well, it's a consequence of they waited too damn long to, you know, I increase the prices because they were looking at a backward uh, um, uh, 12 month lag. And now they're looking at the same 12 month old data. And so they, they go in and say, well, we're data dependent, whatever that is. Uh, and no, let's look at some real world stuff. Yeah. yeah. But that's not what they do. I mean, I, you understand the Federal Reserve is handicapped. They really are. They have 500 PhD economists. And that's about as big a handicap as you can have. Because, I mean, they've got all this data. They have everything that I write and, 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 and you know, all this analysis. Yeah. And they still come up with, you know, they're behind the curve constantly. Well, of course, because they're a non-market institution, right? right? It's it's the, when in Soviet Russia, when they tried to plan the prices of nails rather right. than letting the market determine it, they couldn't do it in a way that allocated the capital effectively. So they started looking across the pond at us to see what the price of nails was. So uh, one way I've framed this before is, you know, it's often said that money is something like the language of value. Mm -hmm. And so where we use language as an abstract representation system for human conception, like where we actually are, you know, turning our perceptions into ideas or higher ideas, we're using it to develop conception and communicate conceptions. Money sort of does the same function, but for human action itself. Yeah. And, no, I think that's a that's a, a beautiful insight. I think money is a kind of language uh -huh. because it is a it is a to use the formula. It's an abstract representation, just as all of language is an abstract representation of something or other. Yeah. So you know, if we take for example, you know, if I take a piece of paper and I print you know one dollar on it, and then it's not actually paper; it's some sort of you know whatever stuff, uh, fabric, but I take that exact same piece of paper and I print $10 on it, the, the intrinsic underlying commodity in this case, this piece of paper with some ink on it is pretty much identical. The only difference is the abstract difference between one and 10. And so there's a, a, an abstraction at work. And that then is to say, we are using arithmetic at a, at a minimum. And arithmetic already is a way of conceptualizing the world, and mathematics is uh, is a kind of a kind of language. And then uh, this is also something that, uh, particularly the Austrians, the early Austrian economists, uh, in their reflections on money, started to emphasize a lot: is uh, money's um, uh, function as an information signaling device across long distances. So, uh, by representing prices and communicating prices, it is sending information. So it is a kind of language. Yeah. And then that, of course, takes us into uh, 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 a lot of the issues about controlling language or not. Mm. And if it's good news or bad news, sometimes the powers that be want to celebrate uh, or, or, or not <laughs> not not celebrate certain, uh, certain bad news, stifle bad news. And one way they try to do that is by controlling the, the money signals that are going on out there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so that takes us into uh, issues of disinformation and, and money is part of disinformation. And what uh, if money is going to be a clear form of communication, what the preconditions of it being a clearer form of communication are. So yes, absolutely, money is a, money is a form of language. One analogy I like to, uh, to use is uh, that money is, is a lot like books. Uh, so if you think about a book, uh, you know, before we had books, printing, and the idea of collecting books, uh, people knew things and they communicated with each other, but we ran into the same problems. How do we communicate our knowledge across long distances? How do we communicate across different languages? And if, you know, since knowledge is stored in the mind of someone, and when that person dies, how do we uh, store that person's knowledge so that it can go past a, past a given generation? And so that uh, communicatory function, when someone hits on the idea of written language that we can write down, again, that requires abstract representation. And it's interesting, again, uh, to go back to the Greeks, that the Greek alphabet was systematized as these abstract symbols, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on, about the same time that the Greeks hit on the widespread use of money as an abstract representation. So there's some sort of conceptual leap that's going on, uh, both in the form of written language and in the form of money that's going on in the, in the Greeks historically. Uh, but then... Uh, what we then say is with a book, I can abstractly represent my knowledge. That knowledge can be communicated to another person at a distance. It can be multiplied at cost. It can be stored for the long term. It can outlive me in particular. Uh, uh, so, you know, you know, say Einstein, for example. <laughs> You know, we don't have to trot Einstein around and have him talk personally to everybody. Einstein can write his ideas down. They can be multiplied. And so just the introduction of books increases the availability of knowledge and makes us smarter. The same thing happens with respect to money because it's performing many of the same functions. It's providing this abstract representation that's uniform, that has durability, uh, and enables translation across various domains. And so it uh, is also a huge exponential leap for economies that adopt it in terms of their efficiency. On the ins insufficiency and indispensability of language, uh, this whole show is built on this. What is money? Um, and again, we, I mean, we've been releasing episodes that have taken clips from my prior guest answering this question. And just sequencing them one after another it's very interesting because there are so many different answers so after three almost three years of asking this question i actually have more questions than answers now based on all the answers we've received back what do you think it is about i would love to hear your articulation of what is money and then i would further like to ask like what is it about that particular question that seems to call out such a wide variety of answers from people I don't know if I'm qualified to answer the question of what is money. Just, is anybody? No, it's okay. <laughs> this is an incredibly uh, complex and vast question, which is why you have such a successful show, I guess. But I always remember, I, re I remember I started thinking about this problem as money being the world's first social protocol through which we are invisibly leaving clues for each other about what things are worth. And those clues are picked up by others. You choose mm -hmm. to buy something at the shop, it sets the price of it. The next time somebody comes by, they're not willing to pay that. The owner knows. Uh, he has to put down the price. We left mm -hmm. little clues for each other that we pick up far, far away. And since that is a, sort of a flow of information that's going around the world, obviously, optimally, again, thinking in truth and love terms, mm -hmm. if there, if the information, if my judgment upon the price is as honest as truthful as possible, and if the price is being set as honest and truthful as possible, the person receiving it takes in that information as truthful and honestly as, as possible. Then that should be the optimal situation. Then free enterprise and and prosperity mm -hmm. should emerge uh, in an optimal sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, of course, that doesn't happen. There's lots of corruption of this protocol mm. uh, in these flows of signals, in these little clues that we leave. People discover that there are choke points. Holy shit! You know, I can actually control your bank account. I can control mm -hmm. this transaction. Or a little bit of capital controls here. We don't mm -hmm. want we don't want too many 
uh, hints to flow in this direction. Yes. What if the people on that side of the line find out what the other people on that side of the line are willing to pay for this? Right. right, 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 right. So you start drawing up this uh, balkanized uh, yeah. uh, social protocol, and the protocol is constantly trying to return to its pure state, in a sense. It constantly yeah. wants to, information wants to be free. Yeah. To use a very uh, old cypherpunk saying, right? Yeah. Um, information wants to be free, and, and that's why free markets and tends to, over time, overcome a lot of hurdles of short-term bureaucracy or right. uh, uh, also fine institutions and so on. Um, but there will always be all these choke points and channels until Bitcoin, until we now suddenly have this tool that allows us to uh, switch out a social protocol that was open to hijacking, yeah. and now we can do clues that are open and accessible to everybody allowing right. us to individually, subjectively approximate truth as, at a much higher rate. Yeah. And since that reaches our shared consensus, that, that means that we can approximate truth in our shared constant of Bitcoin at a, at a better rate. Yeah. And since we organize around that constant, yeah. you and then go back to that full circle of more prosperity, a better world. Yes. Right. Uh, that's I don't a, know if that was too circular. But I, <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's a great way to put it, actually. It's, it reminds me of there's a very popular phrase on Wall Street that price is truth mm. you know the it's the distillation of all known market realities and the information contained in every market actor's mind presumably is uh, of course this isn't perfect right if anything no. price discovery it, it exists today but there's also a large a very compelling argument to be made that fiat currency inhibits price discovery so we're not getting the full truth as you're describing right when when we balkanize or corrupt this money or create choke points price discovery is not uh it's corrupted as well so the the discovery of truth is i think the, you can zoom that out on a more meta level and then ask like hey these fiat institutions that have this power aren't they themselves a form of price discovery aren't they themselves a cost mm -hmm. of uh, doing business that have been discovered and, and imposed and evolved just like every other free market sure function. So even though we often think about these as like oh you know communist centralized government right they themselves were in response to some kind of an incentive. An incentive yeah. and efficiency. Yeah. We often think about it in pure negative terms, like somebody had, I wanted to dominate this, I wanted to get rich and so on. Of course, there's a lot of self-interest. Of course, there's a lot sure. of perverse incentive, sure. bad structural setups, whatever. Right. Um, but a lot of times it's also just like, uh, hey, we had a, a had a problem and right now it was, running a SQL database was better than running Bitcoin. Right. Like it's right. just right. a lot cheaper. Right. Right. Even if it comes with some cost in terms of uh, censorship or right. or whatever else. Yeah, so, but, but we don't often know how costly it will be, right? Exactly. When you're, when you're running that one SQL database at the Fed, we talk about this a lot. You don't know that with the things of Wall Street either, which is the point that the price is right. Yeah. That even if you don't get it, yeah. if you don't understand why the price is what it is, you yeah. don't understand how somebody could allow the government to be doing what it do. It, it is does. what it is. The price is right. Yeah. Like, which is in a way a very Buddhist way of, of looking at things. Yeah. Like, it, it is what it is, except what it is. Yes. And, and uh, there was, you know, nothing not much else to do. So in that in that framing, then you're basically, I think, asserting that money is one of these instruments that is more and probably perhaps the most important thing to the extent that it allows free price discovery. It's one of the me the most important instruments we have for discerning truth yeah. in the world. Absolutely, in the sphere of human action, particularly, mm -hmm. let's say. And the extent to which we corrupt that mechanism is the extent to which we disturb our relationship with truth right they've been doing these um interesting or a, a guy uses like a laser projector on the side of the european central bank building and it just blasts this giant bitcoin logo onto the building and it says study bitcoin and i loved how it said study bitcoin not buy bitcoin or whatever it's like just study it honestly that's why i named the show what is money it's like Ask yourself the question. I'm not, I don't have a prescriptive answer for you. In fact, asking the question for 300 plus episodes, I have more questions than ever. You would think I'd have some answers by now. We do. We have a lot of answers, but more answers led to more questions. And it's, it's a very interesting rabbit hole to say the least. Um, and it, it highlights maybe the insufficiency of language in some respects and, and dealing with, with complex phenomena, but study Bitcoin. Just ask, you know, ask yourself, what is money? And I'm, whatever, do your own research, figure it out for yourself. Um, you know, to say it and try to 
kind of a few words, if you understand that printing money is bad, which I don't know, some people do, some people don't, it doesn't make any sense to counterfeit money, right? If, if money is the thing we use to acquire goods and services and all goods and services require work to produce, doesn't it make sense that all money should require work to produce, right? That's what gold was. That's what Bitcoin is. That's what fiat currency is not. So you can create money with no work. If you can create money with no work that can be used to acquire goods and services which require work, that is an asymmetry that's used to exploit the savings of people, right? So if you're saving in dollars and the central bank can counterfeit dollars, you're being robbed all the time. I don't care if the cash is under your mattress, in your backyard, in your uh, the Caribbean bank account, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? You're using an instrument to save your economic energy that's being counterfeited at scale by a central bank. Like you're not in a good position. You're being exploited. Um, all of these, I mean, so that if you understand that, I guess you would understand that money, printing money is bad. Bitcoin's money you can't print. So that's pretty simple. That's good, right? <laughs> like uncounterfeitable currency. Great. Yeah. That's a that's a win. Um leveraging people's access to payment rails, banks, cash, etc. to stamp out opposing viewpoints. Exactly. To some extent. And it's very uh thematically similar to what happened with the Freedom Convoy in Canada, right? Exactly. Yeah, with the gives the, the Go send me, go fund right. me, whatever it was. Go yeah. fund me, yeah. Yeah. go fund me. Then they went to, they moved from um, go fund me to another site yeah. called Give, Send, Go, I think it was. Uh, and then they did the same thing, yeah. clamped down on that. And to me, that's just, uh, um, that's a total abuse of power. That's the kind of thing you would in a third world country, right? right? Right. And not only that, they seized some of that money. Yeah. You know? Right. Um. And the contributors, they were freezing their bank accounts too. Not even, not just the protesters. Right, yeah. right. And then some of the people who contributed in the United States, they wake up in the morning and they've got journalists knocking on their doors, right. um, you know, basically saying, hey, did you contribute to these people? We want to, you know, sort of a public shaming campaign. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, that's, that's, again, that's the kind of thing you would have found in you know, the Soviet Union and, right. you know, the mid forties or something like that. Yeah. It's scary because we're normalizing these violations of private property to stamp out speech. And the only money that got through in the Canadian convoy, by the way, was Bitcoin. And so there's a very intimate connection between money that can't be stopped and free speech, right? Like you, money that can't be stopped, turned off, interrupted, enables dissidents to have their voice heard. And I think that's a very important point that um, it's easy to maybe watch the news and think, oh, well, they told me these protesters are bad. We needed to shut them down. Let's turn off their bank account. Maybe someone can get behind that by watching the news. But when that, to support that, have that weapon turned around on you, it's like you don't want that option to even exist for anyone, right? right? It's it's a it's an asymmetry that we should seek to remove. Absolutely. And this is why I think Bitcoin's super important. It's a great case study on the importance of Bitcoin and its relationship to free speech. Yeah, it's funny. I did a an interview once of a uh, a porn star. I for, I'm forgetting I'm blanking on her name at one point, but she was a free speech advocate because um she was talking about how uh you know, the big porn sites, Pornhub, whatever, yeah. they um, they can be pressured by Visa and MasterCard because that's how everybody, right. you, know, uh, you know, pays money to those, those sites. And those credit card companies basically created a list of what kinds of things porn stars are committed, are, are permitted to do on screen. So yeah, th th this actress is basically saying, I I have Visa and MasterCard telling me, you know, what positions I can use on screen and stuff like that. If that's not crazy, like, I don't know what is, right. but that's a metaphor for uh, how stupid this is going to get. Yeah. You know, because you, when you have a centralized, you know, sort of hub where they can apply pressure, um, you know, it'll start with something like porn, yes, but it'll move pretty quickly to politics, and, of course, yeah, the media and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's 
it's like money is one of those things that moves humans, mm. right? And so if you can control the flows or turn it off, turn off the spigot, you can, it's more than a psyop in a way. It's like you can actually redirect people, the flow of human action in the world. And that is a radically, that's a power no one should have, basically. That's like, I think, I would argue it's the closest thing to absolute power you can have. And this is why on this show we talk a lot about central banking and how much of a problem it is. It's like you, no one should have that power. Yeah, and I, and I I've been really slow to understand this, mm-hmm. you know, because I came at it from more from the First Amendment side of it. Yeah, but I now I see it, right? Like I think, um, it is, if you can if you can control the transactions, uh, you can apply pressure in all sorts of ways that were previously impossible. The, the question of what is money, and I say it's perspective because everyone has a different perspective, right? I'm sure you've heard of silent weapons for quiet wars. And yes, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. And, I think on your recommendation. And what, another, I'll give you a couple, um, because when you gave the, when you gave the Cliff Note version of uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island to people, this year I gave Return of the Gods by Jonathan Kahn to people who are ultimately confused as to the craziness of society. I think you should read it. Everyone should read it. It's a great book. But in the middle of this, the what is money... They determined, they, they wanted to create, explained money as being energy. And money is energy. Everything is energy. I'm a quantum guy. So literally everything, this is energy. Matter is a false Frozen of energy. Yeah. Correct. It's not even frozen. It's just slower. So yeah, lower wavelength, lower Correct. frequency. The frequency. Energy. So, you know, I always talk about the resonant effect when frequencies match. It's like a relationship. When you when you have the same frequency as the person next to you and you get along, you're going to be friends forever. When you have a, a break in that energy, it ruins things. And that's that's also a quantum piece. But there's also quantum tunneling, which is something people don't know about, is that Mother Nature can actually raise the vibration of an element to match the vibration of a barrier to penetrate the barrier. So when you talk about like movies where guys walk through a wall, that's science fiction in the movie, but it's a reality in quantum physics. So there are tunnelings, there are cells that go through barriers of veins to leak into the bloodstream. Many things of example. So if we look at money as energy, and I think that's a good perspective on it because that's how the enemy wants us to believe money operates. So if we look at it from that perspective on energy, I can't disagree with the argument. If you have a lot of it, you have a lot of energy. You want to do a lot of things. If you have no money, I've been on both sides. When you have no money, you'd really want to do anything because I don't want to spend the last reserves of my energy in order to fill my need for more. Right. Uh third chapter here bitcoin and monetary history i'm sure there's uh, obviously bitcoin has a lot to do with monetary history given it's the latest chapter in the story of monetary history um maybe we could focus this question on like why gold why did gold become money of all the things that we've been trying across history and how does bitcoin then slot into that as maybe the next chapter beyond gold right i believe um the most important um function of money is to preserve value mm-hmm. uh, so that uh, in a sufficiently developed society mm-hmm. with a high uh, division of labor and complexity, uh, people wouldn't need to work as much if they were only to um, satisfy their present needs. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but, but it's much better for the society if, uh, for example, a blacksmith works for eight hours instead of one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for a blacksmith, he would need to maybe work just for an, for one hour to get the food he needs for the yes. day. Right. So uh, the way for the society to incentivize uh, the blacksmith to work for the full uh, working day mm-hmm. is for him to be able to save and to maybe save up for a nicer house, a uh, nicer car, stuff like mm-hmm. that. And uh, for that, he needs money that... Uh, uh, retains the value uh-huh. uh, and not just for tomorrow or week after it but maybe for for years uh-huh. or for decades because uh-huh. uh, he wants to save up for for his children uh-huh. so um, that's why uh, the store of value fu- function of money is uh, the most important for for money itself uh-huh. and the other functions like minimum of exchange and unit of account they are basically like logically following that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and gold, uh, as a uh, very scarce metal, very scarce element, that's also quite easily found uh, all around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not limited to just one place in, uh, mm-hmm. in, the, in the Earth's crust, but it's quite uh, well uh, uh, divided. Uh, mm-hmm. d- yeah, distributed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
It's uh, and it's also like uh, easily um, you can smelt it and you can uh, coin it into uh, because it's a soft metal, but it's scarce mm -hmm. at the same time, and uh, it's um, uh, it, do it doesn't rust, right? Yes, so basically indestructible. It's indestructible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it has this like good set of uh, physical qualities mm -hmm. that uh, led to all the societies that uh, came into contact with gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and had the abilities to create a coinage out of that mm. uh, to adopt it uh, as as uh, as money. Yes, yeah. I think it comes back to what you said earlier that you know preserving value is the number one function. The flip side of preserving value is knowing that someone's not going to arbitrarily compromise the supply. Right? That it has a high degree of supply integrity. Yeah, and that's what enables something to preserve value over time. So it's like we've been searching and experimenting with all these different monetary technologies across time, and we found that well, it turns out gold was the closest thing we had to that ideal yeah. of a fixed supply money. Right? It was the most relatively scarce commodity that otherwise exhibited good monetary properties. So gold became money, mm -hmm. and um, I think also through that lens is a good aperture through which to evaluate Bitcoin's value going into the future. Yeah. So um, in the chapter Bitcoin and Monetary History, I point out that whenever uh, the state uh, became involved in uh, the definition of money, mm -hmm. in the issuance of money, uh, it always used it, uh, used it as a leverage to plunder from the productive society. Yes. Yes. Uh, to legal plunder, as legal plunder. Yeah. it. Yeah. It's a legal plunder. Uh, and it's very, um, in effect, it's very sophisticated way to uh, to loot uh, the value from mm -hmm. the productive society because you don't uh, go around like robbing people mm -hmm. uh, uh, like that. But uh, you like the the most um, simple way to do that is to basically take in uh, take in the coins, uh, lower the gold content, and issue the new coins with the same nominal value. Yes, uh, that's like the original form of uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, many currencies throughout the history are basically destroyed like that because once you set on this path, uh, it's very hard to go back from that. And mm -hmm. usually, it leads to a total, uh, total um, undermining of the currency in several hundred years. And uh, I believe, uh, as the knowledge about Bitcoin spreads throughout the society, like to what we do, yeah, uh, to education, to uh, necessity, mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin will tend to be adopted as this. Uh, non-state money uh, first because of its store of value function. Mm. Uh, in some places like Africa, where uh, money doesn't work as a store of value, but doesn't work even as a medium of exchange because they don't have uh, like the ability to do uh, digital payments, mm -hmm. it's starting to work even uh, as a medium of exchange right now, like Africa, uh, South Africa, yes. Nigeria. Right. Uh, so uh, like, it's uh, it's an emerging phenomenon. It, uh, I don't believe it really matters if any state uh, like allows it or uh, makes it a legal tender. Mm -hmm. That uh, they may slightly accelerate it or mm -hmm. accelerate it, but it's uh, the separation of money and state is, I believe, unstoppable and uh, an emerging phenomenon that's happening all around the world. Yeah. And uh, it's inevitable because the economic laws and the incentives of uh, individuals. And later, maybe even companies and yeah. uh, and uh, their governments uh, will uh, like it cannot lead to anything else than right. separation of money and state. Yeah, yeah. As sure as gravity pulls things down to earth, right? That these natural laws hold, and individuals that seek to preserve purchasing power over time will kind of be forced into using Bitcoin at some point. Um, that's the general theory, at least. Uh, yeah. So far, so good. 14 years into Bitcoin's history.